Thank you, Joe and Carrie, Kaylin, Jackson, and Lily. And then little Ethan is back in the nursery. His singing isn't quite that pretty because usually it's, it's out of anger or hunger. And so thank you so much, Barriers, for that. Let's turn to John chapter 4 this morning. John chapter 4. If you're in first through third grade, you can slip out to our children's church during this time. We can find our rest in Jesus. What a beautiful message through that song. I think that song fits well with the theme of John chapter 4. <coughs> John chapter 4, we find Christ having a conversation with the woman at the well. I think often when we look at this passage, we ask the question, how would I have a conversation with someone who needs Christ like this? And we put ourselves in the place of Jesus here, but I think the Apostle John is calling us to put ourselves in the place of the woman of Samaria. That those are the shoes that we should fill in our mind this morning as we look at this account. I'd like to give you a a phrase that I think is going to guide us as we look at this first portion. We'll actually be looking at this account for the next three Sunday mornings. This is the longest conversation that Jesus has with any any person in Scripture that we have recorded. Longer uh, recorded for us than uh, the, the conversation with Nicodemus, longer than any of the conversations with the disciples. It doesn't mean it is the longest conversation he ever had, but it's the longest recorded conversation that we have for us in Scripture. And so I think it bears our special attention as we look at the character and nature of Christ through John chapter 4, and as we put ourselves in the place of this woman of Samaria through whom God is drawing to himself, I believe. Let's look at John chapter 4. We'll read verses 1 through 15 as our text for the morning, and I'd like to I'd like for this to be our premise, okay? This woman can only, is focused on, we should say it this way, she's focused on only what she can see. And she needs to look beyond what she can physically see. And in order to do that, she needs the Holy Spirit to work in her life. You can say she can only see what she can see in front of her. And there's so much more that Christ is offering as we will unfold over these next three weeks. Being in an unsaved state, being dead spiritually, she can only see what she can see in front of her. John chapter 4, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and if you knew who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave to us the well and drank from it himself, as he did, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. 
And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. God, will you give grace and help us to see the scripture for what it is, your truth. May we have confidence in the Bible that it would reveal our nature and thus our need for a Savior and reveal your nature as God. As we pray in the name of our high priest, Jesus Christ, amen. If you were raised in the church or you've been a Christian for any amount of time, no doubt you've probably heard this account referenced or possibly even preached on. Some refer to it as the woman at the well, some refer to it as the woman of Samaria, even some more as the message about living water. And as we approach this passage this morning, I'd like to offer a br- couple of brief introductory notes that will help us approach this passage and, and, and gain what I believe is John's inference, John's purpose for including not only this message, but also this message in the place in the book and focusing on it so specifically. We first of all have to realize that this this account is given within the context of the book of John, meaning that this meeting of the woman at the well, the Sumerian woman and Jesus, is meant to be seen in the same context as Nicodemus and we'll see in future weeks as the Roman official who begins in verse 46. This passage can't be lifted out of its context and fully understood uh, 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 and get a full understanding of what Jesus is doing here. We have to realize that John is actually giving a comparison and a contrast with Nicodemus and with this Roman official in verse, beginning of verse 46. And I'll show it to you this way. There is a very specific contrast given between Nicodemus and the woman of Samaria. Let's look at these contrasts. Well, obviously, one is a man and one is a woman. Secondly, one is named and one is unnamed. You have Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, and you have this generic woman of Samaria who comes to draw water. You have Nicodemus coming by night, and you have this woman coming in the middle of the day. That's what the sixth hour means. It means noontime. And I referenced back in, Nicod- in the story of Nicodemus when it says Nicodemus came by night. Be careful. Be careful not to read too much into that. There may be more of an inference there, but we need to remember that when it says Nicodemus came by night, it means he came by night. And when it says that she came during the day, it doesn't have any reference to her righteousness yet, right? Because some people will say, Nicodemus came by night, and that reveals the darkness of his soul. Well, if that's the case, then her coming at high noon means that she has full righteousness. And that's definitely not the case here, okay? And so I think the contrast that's given is between Nicodemus coming at night and and this lady coming during the day. Nicodemus was also a leader of the Jews. And here this woman is a shunned Samaritan. You have the moral man who lives as an example to all and then this immoral woman who comes seeking water. There is a contrast at almost every single point in the story to reveal to us that the message of Christ is not just meant for one group of people. When Jesus calls the world to repentance, he's calling the Pharisaical Nicodemuses of the world as well as the immoral outcasts of the woman at the well, and he's calling them both to the same message. The message of repentance and faith. As we look at this passage, secondly, this morning, not only do we need to make sure that we see the contrast between Nicodemus and the woman at the well, we also need to see within this context that we can learn some things from the Nicodemus story and from the Jesus story and how they interact as to the sharing of the gospel and to evangelistic efforts. And we definitely can learn some principles here, and we'll even draw one out 
with Jesus and the woman at the well, but this is not a how-to of personal evangelism either. Jesus and Nicodemus is not a how-to on evangelism, although there are some principles that we can glean. And the woman at the well is not a how-to on evangelism, though there are some principles that we can glean here. The primary focus of John chapter 4, as it is John chapter 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, we go all the way through chapter 20, is the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we need to focus on that and how this passage reveals that to us. This is all about Jesus. I want to give you an illustration as to how um, not understanding what I just said can lead you to some really false um, focuses of the passage, implications, some false applications of how you should act. I was in my, in my studies this week, came across a message of someone who preached a massive part of their message on the phrase in verse 7 where Jesus says, give me a drink. And the whole premise of his message was, God needs things from you. Jesus needed a drink from this woman, and God needs your obedience in order to accomplish his mission. That you are responsible for sharing this everlasting water with, with everyone around you. And, and is that ultimate conclusion the truth? Yes, like God has chosen his church to bring the message of salvation to the world. But that, the way he got there was totally wrong. Okay, That is not why Jesus says, give me a drink of water at all. And so we need to be careful in the way that we approach these passages that we're approaching them in the way that the author intends. And therefore we'll understand these passages in the way that the Holy Spirit intends us to understand them and apply them to our life. This is a beautiful picture of the compassionate heart of Jesus as he interacts with the outcasts of society. You ever felt like an outsider? You ever felt like someone who doesn't quite fit in? Someone who's different maybe because of your background or maybe because of your present condition? Maybe because of some choices that you've made that have ongoing consequences. And because of that, you have questions like, does, does God view me the same way that he views someone who hasn't made these choices. And here in this account, we find the beautiful, compassionate heart of Christ to both, the, to, to, we should say all three, the ruler of the Jews, a Samaritan immoral outcast, and a Roman official. All have the same need. The, their need is to be born again by the Holy Spirit. The goal is not to look for some hidden truth or a new revelation, but to examine this text and its story and to let it teach us about Jesus. And so let's look there together. There's a word that you would like for the heading of verses 1 through 4. You can use the word mission. Mission. We learn in verse 1 that the Pharisees are approaching life and ministry in Jerusalem as if they are the arbiter of everything good that happens. And maybe you know someone like this, that if ministry hasn't happened under their viewpoint, it's suspect, and, and they need to approve all the ministry that happens. And if they aren't approving of this ministry, there's probably not genuine ministry happening, or there's probably some subversion at work, or they just don't know well enough to check in with them before they do ministry in the area. And so we see the Pharisees stepping in and hearing of Jesus baptizing and John baptizing. Back in chapter 1 and verses 24 and 25, we see the Pharisees checking up on John in the wilderness and sending these people saying, hey, we're, we hear you're baptizing. Uh, we want to make sure you're doing this the right way. And then all of a sudden, Jesus hits their radar because Jesus and his, his disciples are baptizing more than John as they are amassing followers in verse 1. As Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. And then in verse 2, very interestingly enough, 
John goes out of his way to reference the fact that Jesus did not baptize. I've really been meditating on that statement these last two weeks. I brought it up last week as part of the message, and, and I, I referenced the truth that, um, you know, Jesus didn't baptize because he didn't want to, uh, I believe he didn't want to stir up any, any confusion or um, dissension, as some were saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of John, I'm of, I'm of Paul, you know. Paul says, I'm so glad I didn't baptize any but a couple of you so that there's no division among the body of Christ. And I think certainly that, that was a motivating factor. However, as I've been thinking and meditating on this, this verse in chapter 2, I'd like to bring to you one more important implication in regards to our view of the gospel that this verse emphasizes. I think it's important for us to recognize that every bit of merit and righteousness that we have in our life flows from the person of Christ. There is not one ounce of righteousness you have that is of your own. We sing about that. We've been singing about that all month. My worth is not in what I own. My worth is not in what I do. It's found in the person of Christ alone. And so I believe that the Apostle John is giving us here in verse 2 a statement about how the merit and righteousness of Christ is applied to people. And and I, I don't think it's going beyond this passage to say that Christ did not want to confuse people by having them assume that somehow when Christ baptizes them, that they are receiving any sort of merit or any sort of righteousness that flows from that. That all of the baptisms that are accomplished are signifying something, and they are only signifying something. You have the baptism of salvation, the the confession of salvation, which we practice. And that baptism, that confession of salvation, adds no saving merit to your life. It adds no righteousness to your life. And yes, we say, buried with him in, in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. But that is as an illustration of your justification, of your redemption, of your salvation. That baptism adds no righteousness, it adds no merit, and all of your merit flows through the person of Christ. All of your righteousness is what we would refer to as an alien righteousness, a righteousness outside of yourself, not not from you. And so therefore, I believe that verse 2 can be rightly viewed as a theological statement that your baptism adds no righteousness and no spiritual merit. Does it add, is, is it a means of grace? Yes. Just as any act of obedience is. As when you obey, you find the grace of God bestowed on your life to fuel you to further obedience. But does it administer any merit or any righteousness? And the answer is no. Baptism does not save, nor does it add to your salvation. It is simply a picture, an illustration of your salvation. So in verse 2, I, in, in my meditations, I, I, I truly believe that. And I believe we see that reflected here, that Jesus did not baptize. In verses 3 and 4, we see... Jesus leaving Judea and going again to Galilee, going back to Cana or or, or the area in which he turned water to wine. And there's this very interesting phrase in verse 4, he had to pass through Samaria. And we see a phrase like this, we never want to make too much of it, nor do we want to make too little of it. There are two options with this phrase. Uh, This could be a statement about geography meaning to get, from, to get from point A to point C, you had to go through point B. And it could be a statement about Jesus com- being compelled by his gospel mission 
to take the message of redemption to those who are being called by God, who are being drawn. And he's saying, I must do this. Um, I, I would land towards the latter. And the reason is we find later in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus travels again from, Ju- from Judea to Galilee and he doesn't go through Samaria. And so I think this word translated must or compelled, I think that's a really important word here. And that when he says, I must go through Samaria, it's one thing if you say, okay, in order for me to exit this room, I must go through one of these doors, right? But if I tell you, I must go through that door, it tells you that there's something specific about that action. And here, John uses a very specific word, must, and I believe what this is, this is one of the many phrases that we'll actually see through the book of John of Jesus being compelled to gospel mission through obedience and love for the Father. That he is being driven in his gospel endeavor through Samaria to Galilee. And thus we see the mission is not just about the destination, but also about the travel to the destination. Mission, verses 1 through 4. If you would like a word to guide you in verses 5 through 6, some of you are uh, outline people, you can put down the word human. Human. Or humanity. So he, Jesus, came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph, gives us a a very specific geographical note as the Bible is very specific here. Samaria was the capital of the northern part of Israel, if you'll remember, because of David's sin with Bathsheba. Uh, The judgment on the life of David was that the kingdom would be divided, and so after the reign of Solomon, thus the kingdom of Israel was divided into the northern and southern kingdoms. If you know anything about the northern kingdom, you know the northern kingdom never had a righteous king to the best of my knowledge they were all wicked they were terrible kings and thus the northern kingdom was taken into exile in Assyria for you can read about it in first kings 16 and second kings 17 in the Assyrian invasion specifically uh, in regards to uh, Samaria you can look at second kings 17 all the way down to the very end that says that when they came back I think it's the end of second kings 17 that says uh, they continued worshiping Yahweh and other gods there was a syncretistic religion which is one of the reasons why the Jews hated the Samarians so much second kings 17 we read that Samaria had had um, as a northern kingdom of Israel had alienated themselves from the true God and had brought in other gods and thus were idolaters. It is interesting that um, if, if you read, some of you like to read Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias, and if you read on Samaria, there are some who would believe that at this point in the New Testament, that the Samaria in general, Samaritans had come back to worship uh, Yahweh alone, I believe John MacArthur would be in that camp. There are some who would believe that. Uh, That could be the case. Uh, We're not really sure. You know, history is just uh, what we read about and interpret as much as we can. We do know that whatever the case, there was a a spark of of, um, Judaistic beliefs left in Samaria. Thus, we'll see that next week in what the woman believes. But he's in Samaria. The Jews rejected the Samaritans. Um, in, in, in this Jewish context, there was a, a hatred even towards the Samaritans. They were viewed as half-breeds, idolaters. The, the Samaritans in general, even if they were worshipers of Yahweh, rejected everything past Deuteronomy. The Torah was it. So they come to the field where Jacob gave Joseph, is what the scripture says. This is probably where Joseph's bones were buried. And the location of Jacob's well What is Jacob's well? Jacob's well is 100 feet deep. 1,500 years before this account with Christ and this woman at the well, the well had been dug and had been continually fed by fresh water, a spring that continually bubbled up to give fresh water there. 
So in verse 5, he comes to Samaria near the field. Jacob had given his son Joseph. In verse 6, Jacob's well was there. This was a treasured well, a well that was viewed as special for the people of Israel because Jacob himself had dug it. And you could say, <coughs> when someone lowers a basket uh, or with a skin on it or a, or a pot or something down in Jacob's well and pulls up water maybe to feed their animals, they could say, Jacob and his sons did the same thing from this very well. It's a very special well. And so we see Jesus here at Jacob's well. Verse 6 also tells us that Jesus was wearied as he was from his journey, sitting beside the well. And thus we are reminded that Jesus is truly human. Jesus is everything that it means to be man. He gets tired. He gets hungry. He gets thirsty. He is exhausted. He's been walking all day in the, the wilderness, in the desert. And he comes to a well and he has nothing to draw water with. And so he sits down and he's exhausted and it's high noon. Maybe he's in the shade, maybe he's not, but the sun is beating down on him. And as I preached to you last week, we must understand the person of Jesus correctly. Truly God Truly man, we see the humanity of Jesus on full display as he is utterly exhausted and weak. J.C. Ryle, I, I told you early on about a book that we have at the Resource Center, Expository Notes on the Gospel of John by J.C. Ryle. J.C. Ryle is awesome because he writes so simply. And uh, he, he writes the following from that book uh, about this instance. He says, he to whom sinners are bid to come for pardon and peace is one who is man as well as God. We have at the right hand of God a high priest who can be touched with our infirmities because he has suffered himself being tempted. When we cry to him in the hour of bodily pain and weakness, he knows well what we mean. When our prayers and praises are feeble, through bodily weariness, he can understand our condition. He knows our frame. He has learned by experience what it is to be a man. And friend, when you find yourself absolutely and utterly exhausted from the day's activities, from your busyness of life, and all of a sudden God brings someone into your life with whom you should share the gospel, you find yourself in the position of Jesus. And when you pray and you say, Lord, would you give me grace? Lord, would you give me strength to be a, a right example of you? Lord, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I can't even think straight. And yet I have this opportunity to witness. Would you make me faithful? You're praying to a high priest who's been there and who's been faithful. And so thus you can find grace and encouragement in your time of need. verse 7, we find that Jesus is not deterred by social customs. That he is not a bigot. That there's no judgment in regards to background or race. And here in verse 7, the scene, as, as often John does with his scenes, he gives you the setting and then he gives you that moment where it begins this, this tension. And this is that moment in verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And now Jesus is in trouble because he's by himself. And here's a woman from Samaria walking to draw water. Jesus said to her. He begins the conversation. He breaks the barrier and he says, give me a drink. Everything about this account flies in the face of social normalcy, of, of everything that would be accepted in society, of this woman coming alone to Jesus alone in the middle of, of at, at a well where, 
where wells were places of meeting and where, you know, the, Jacob found his wife and all of these different things. If you trace wells throughout Scripture, all sorts of things happen at wells. And so you have this woman coming to this man all by themselves, and then Jesus is the one who leans into the conversation. And Jesus is the one who speaks. And he says, will you please give me a drink? Now, Jews, especially teachers, were not to associate with these Samaritan outcasts, much less a Samaritan woman, much less an su- immoral Samaritan woman. Right? And, and, I mean, women were looked down on. Jesus constantly elevated women. There's a very uh, famous quote in the apocryphal writings from, from a Jewish rabbi who would always begin his prayers with, Dear God, thank you that you have not made me a woman. Okay? This was a, a culture that degraded women that looked down on women. And what's interesting is that you always see Jesus lifting women up. You always see Jesus stepping in and lifting women to a place of honor where they're supposed to be. Treating everyone as on the same plane. In in the book of Acts, you see women playing a key role. And obviously, uh, according to, to, to what Paul tells Timothy, that women should not be teaching men in a public setting or exerting spiritual authority over men, but that does not mean that women do not play a key role in the church. That scripture, unlike the culture, steps in and elevates women. And thus, we should do the same with the heart of Christ. This woman comes with either a jar or an animal skin sewed into a water container and to to lower down into the well and draw water. Jesus is thirsty. His disciples have gone to get food and Jesus asks the woman to draw him a drink. This is not Jesus demanding a drink. You know, if, if I were to walk into a situation and quote the words of Jesus, give me a drink, it may seem a little bit brash, right? But that's not at all what's happening here. Don't read that into the scenario. He's actually asking her to do something in that culture, which is very honored, and that is meet the needs of a guest. Show, show hospitality. I will allow you. I'm asking you to serve me. It was a, it was a, a thing of honor. Like if, if Jesus were to show up at someone's house and ask for a drink or ask for a meal, that person would feel so honored that a rabbi would come to them. And so Jesus is showing honor to her by asking for a drink. It makes sense. He's thirsty. She's drawing water. Can I please have a drink? Notice that Jesus begins the conversation She didn't speak first, he did. And this is where we could actually pull out a principle of many of our gospel conversations is that if you wait for an unsaved person to begin a spiritual conversation, you'll be waiting forever, right? Is that it it is the responsibility of the believer to step in and to begin that conversation, to begin the relationship. And the woman is totally astounded that Jesus would talk to him. Look at verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. She's just blown away that you would do this. And then the end of verse 9, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Look at that note there. It's been misunderstood by a lot of people thinking that, that Jews and Samaritans had a, a distance from each other and never did anything together. And that's not the case because where did the, the disciples just go to buy food and buy drink? They went into Sychar. They went into a Samaritan village to deal with Samaritans, to buy food, to deal with Samaritans, to buy things from them, to eat Samaritan food, to drink Samaritan drink. So it's not what what John is saying here. That phrase, have no dealings with, is really interesting. It's saying everybody knows that Jews and Samaritans don't have a share together don't have this close sharing relationship. What is she balking at? She's balking at the fact that she only had one water pot. So where was Jesus going to get his drink from? He didn't have a cup. He didn't have a ladle. He was going to drink from her water pot. And she says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're a Jew. You're asking me for a drink? You're going to drink from my cup? 
You're going to drink from, from my, my, my drawing device, whatever she had, my skin? You're going to drink from that? Everybody knows that Jews and Samaritans can't share utensils like this. They can't share cups. They can't share eating utensils. Remember the ceremonial washings? that the Pharisees had imposed on the Jews, and here Jesus is just breaking down every barrier. What you call unclean, I don't call unclean. For the greatest need here is for this woman to be reborn. Just like the conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus here is breaking down these barriers and giving physical illustrations in order to give a spiritual truth. So if you'd like a phrase for those verses, it would be something like, you know, non-bigotry. That he is coming with an open mind. I don't really like that phrase because they're supposed to be closed to, to, to the world, open to Scripture. But he is coming open. Look at verse 10. Eternal life. I love the first three words of Jesus. Look at verse 10. Look at his first three words. If you knew. I love that. If you only knew. I was talking with Pastor Ben this week and I was talking about this passage and it was on my mind, like just setting on my mind because I wonder how many times God in his compassion and his love looks at us that way when we complain. God, why haven't you given me? If you only knew. God, why does it hurt so much? Why do I have to go through this? Why do I have? Why do I not have? Why does this longing in my heart never satisfied? I've prayed for this over and over again. I haven't got. I haven't gotten. I haven't received. Or I've received too much. And yet Jesus looks on her with compassion And she says, why would you talk to me? I'm unclean. And he goes, oh, if you only knew. Two things. He anchors this knowledge in two things. Look down at verse 10. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew what God was offering you, if you knew what God would give, if you knew what God possessed, if you knew this gift, if you knew the gift that God had, If you only knew this gift better, you'd treasure your salvation more. You wouldn't be driven to covetousness because you find what God has given you in salvation. If you only knew the gift of God. Secondly, and who it is who's saying to you, give me a drink. Friend, if you find yourself in a time of covetousness, if you find yourself in a time of discontent, if you find yourself in an area in which you just don't understand, in which you just don't comprehend what's going on, if you find yourself, uh, in, in, you know, James would call it, carried up and down by trials, right? These waves of emotions. Jesus says you need to know two things. Number one, you need to know your God better. You need to know the character of God. If you knew who was talking to you, oh, if you only knew Jesus. And secondly, if you only knew that his gifts were good, if you knew the stability that he offers and only giving you what's best for you, if you knew the gift of God, and if you knew who it was that was talking to you, what is his answer? What, what, what would that? What would come of that knowledge? Well, you would have asked him if you knew the gift of God, and you knew if you knew what I could give you, and you knew my character. You actually would have been asking me. Jesus is telling the woman that the situation should be reversed. She's approaching the situation as if she has what Jesus needs. And Jesus is saying, oh, if you only knew, I have what you need. God is not in need of anything from us. God did not create man because he was lonely. Or because somehow he needed something from man. 
Friend, God doesn't need anything from you. God desires your worship. He doesn't need anything from you. He doesn't need you. You need him. How many times have we thought, man, God, it's a good thing you created me. Don't know what you'd do without me. He says, oh, if you only knew. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. If you only knew, you would ask. The peace of God comes. Hebrews 4, 16, let us in with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and, and, and find grace to help in our time of need. If you knew God, you would ask. You wouldn't try everything else and be exhausted on every other side. You'd come to God, and if you knew who he was, and you knew the gift that he would give, you would run to him first, and you would ask. And what would happen when you ask? Look at the end of verse 10. He would have given you. He would have given you. Listen to Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. This is a fascinating verse. If you then who are earthly know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Good things. One of the greatest joys as a parent is to give good gifts to your kids. Every parent wants to give good things to their kids. Birthdays come and there's a, there's a, a gift that you know that your child is really going to be excited over. And, and you keep it till last, and you give that gift, and you watch the eyes light up. Right? When they're really young, you give them a gift, and they play with the box, right? You ever notice that? You know, maybe we just go to the U-Haul store for Christmas this year and just buy boxes, you know? And here, you get the boxes as your present. I'll keep what's inside of them, right? But, but there's something about a parent that loves to give good gifts, and what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7 with the Sermon on the Mount, he's saying, listen, if you love to good, give good gifts to others, how much more, from the lesser to the greater, he's arguing here, how much more does God love to give good gifts to you and pour out his goodness? And Jesus looks at this woman and he says, you know, lady, if you only knew the goodness that I possess, if you only knew the, the character of, of the desire of God to pour it out, you would ask and I would freely give. And what does he give in this context? He gives what he calls living water. Living water is water that's fresh and flowing. I think it's obvious for us as New Testament readers to see that Jesus has a double meaning here, but this woman can't see past what she can see. And so for us, we can see past what she can see. But for her, without being born again, she can't see the kingdom of God. She can only see what she can see, and so she misinterprets this as moving fresh water, which is I don't, I don't know what Jesus meant, but I wonder if he kind of knew that it was going this way. Verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? And she like sets Jesus up. Are you greater than Jacob? Jacob. There, there, are a couple, there, there are a couple things that are going on here. It's really interesting. I can't decide if this woman is being sarcastic, if she's being argumentative, if she's upset that he's, um, that he's talking to her. There are actually some commentators that would believe, and, and I don't necessarily know that it could be the case, but I don't necessarily know that I fall in this camp. There are some um, commentators that are believe that she's actually trying to seduce him here with some water interesting. I, I don't know what's going on here, but there's some sort of undercurrent here where she is, she's going to ask him, well, where are we going to worship? Are we going to worship on that mountain? Jews say we got to worship on this mountain. Are you greater than Jacob? I mean, you got animals to water. There's like this interesting dynamic here where she keeps trying to derail the conversation. What are you going to drink water with? Jews don't drink water. And, and Jesus is just laser focused. 
He never shifts off the main idea. And once again, we see some principles that we can glean. Have you ever been witnessing to someone and they want to sidetrack you with all sorts of questions? Like, can Jesus build a rock so, make a rock so big you can't lift it? And if God is so good, why is there all this evil in the world and all this kind of stuff? And there are good answers to those questions. Great answers to those questions. Every question that you can ask has an answer from Scripture, either by example, principle, doctrine, teaching, whatever it is. There is an answer for that. But so often, people who are unsaved want to distract from the message of the gospel by inserting all of these arguments and building straw men and all this kind of stuff, and Jesus just stays right on track. Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from him himself, as did his sons and his livestock. You don't have any water. Where are you going to get the water? Are you greater than Jacob? And like for me, I'm sitting there going, of course he is. He's going to get the water from himself. Jesus, come on, just step in. Just step into her questions, answer her questions. But he's not, in, he's not interested in answering all of these questions. He's going to her greatest need. He's saying, you, can't, you need to see beyond what you can see here. You need to look beyond. But because she's spiritually dead, she can only see what she can see. And so here the in verses 11 and 12, we would have the phrase, Jesus is greater. He is. But he's focused. Jacob dug this well, 100 feet down through solid limestone. Can you do better than that? Are you going to dig up a whole river? Really? Here? And Jesus says to her in verse 13, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again this water in this well. But whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. That water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. And as a, as a believer, we're saying yes. Because we've experienced that, haven't we? To the power of God's life given to us at the moment of salvation, that life that is inserted into us, and then all of a sudden you are recreated to be someone new, and God's mercies are new every morning, and that life never ceases, and so this life continues to spring up inside of you because the life of Christ will eternally satisfy. The life of Christ will eternally renew. What is this water that he promises. It's the same water that he tells Nicodemus. you got to be born of water in the Spirit. You see this? I mean, this theme is all throughout the Old Testament. It's all throughout the New Testament that the water is the Holy Spirit Amen. implanted in the life of the believer. And once you get a taste of that life, you'll never be satisfied with any other life as the world grows dim and righteousness grows bright. I was having a conversation the other day with someone, as I often do, about food. And we were talking about steak. And I, uh, I asked him the question, have you ever been to Ruth's Chris to have a steak at Ruth's Chris? And he said no. And my advice to him was don't go. Ever. Why? He looked at me kind of confused. Why? Well, because... We, my wife and I had the opportunity to celebrate an anniversary. Someone gave us a gift to go to Ruth's Chris, and so we went to Ruth's Chris, and I had a steak, and it was the biggest mistake I ever made because when you have a steak at Ruth's Chris, every other steak is subpar. And so if you go back to a normal steakhouse, you say, man, that was good, but it's not quite, it's not quite Ruth's Chris, you know? And you go to another steakhouse, and you say, man, that steak was really good, but it's not quite as good as that. And so you, I, I shouldn't say you, I, you know, you, you go down the road of researching how do they do it? And what kind of meat do they get? And what kind of butter do they use? And what kind of seasonings do they use? And how do they grill it? And you try to, you try to mimic that at your home, right? And, and, and you, you pull it out and your expectations are so high. And you say you love food too much. I know, I'm working on it, okay? And we'll get to that in John 6, when Jesus is the bread of life. We'll have a whole message just on a biblical approach to food, which I think we all need. Uh, but until then, I'm just going to live in ignorance. But anyway, um, 
But you approach and you, and, and, and you, you say, I, I did this just right and I made everything just right. And you take a first bite and you say, man, that is a good steak. But it, it's just not quite as good as that other one. And, and that's what Jesus is communicating with this welling up into eternal life. Friends, it's this sense that when you live in a full, an open and right relationship with God that is pure and and free of unconfessed sin and you're in scripture and you worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ until heaven, friends, this is as good as it gets. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you either need to be born again or you need to confess sin in your life. Because when you gather with God's people and you worship or you're in the word and you read and you get a hold of truth and you just can't stand it, you say, this is as good as it gets. And everything else just starts to dim as my view of Christ gets brighter. And what Jesus is saying is, when you get this well of eternal life, it's going to bubble up inside you and it's going to continue to satisfy and it's going to be as good as it gets. Jesus is greater. And our hearts cry out for this dear Samaritan woman. But friends, she can't see past what she can see. Look at verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. And we say, Oh! Right? She got it. So that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Friend, before you accept Jesus, you need to ask the question, what do you want from Jesus? Because the answer to that question will tell you whether or not You're genuinely converted. What do you want from Jesus? You want him to fix your life? You want to make your life better? That's what she wanted. Oh, do you know how great it would be to be able to walk in the wilderness and the desert all day and not be thirsty? Do you know how awesome it would be not to have to come out here at noon when all the other ladies come first thing in the morning and here I am, an outcast. They won't let me come with them because I'm an immoral woman. I'm, I'm an outcast from society. I have to come separate and I have to lug these water jars or these skins all the way from my house every single day at the heat of noon because I've been outcast from society. Do you know how good it'd be just to sit at home and rest? I would love that. Because Jesus, please make my life better. Take away my pain. And just like that, she missed it. Oh, Jesus, give me this water. Because I want an easy life. Friend, be careful. You can accept Jesus without believing the gospel and still go to hell. For there will be many in that day who will cry out, Lord, Lord. Did I not perform signs? Did I not cast out demons in your name? And Jesus says, you you called on a Jesus, but it wasn't me because I never knew you. I'm sharing this with some this week and talking about the reason for understanding deeper theology and understanding the person of Christ, so that when you get to heaven, you'll recognize Jesus. Friends, that's a scary thought. That you get to heaven and you don't recognize him because you've been believing wrongly. That he's not who you expect him to be. And so we must look at scripture and say, is the living water of the gospel the living water that's springing up in my life? Am I genuinely converted? Have I been born again? You see, prophets said in Scripture that there will be those who have eyes, Jeremiah 5.21, but cannot see. For she had eyes, but she could not see. 
There will be those who have ears but cannot hear. And she heard Jesus, but she didn't really hear him. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 2 and four, two through 4. Moses summoned all of Israel and said, You've seen all the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to the land, the great trials that your eyes saw and the signs and those great wonders that we see in Romans chapter 9, that God raised up Pharaoh and Egypt to show his glory like he's never done before and he'll never do again, like he showed his glory through the plagues of Egypt and the judgment of Pharaoh. And Moses said, you saw the glory of God, verse 4, but to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. He said, you saw Egypt, but you didn't see Egypt. You saw Pharaoh, but you didn't see Pharaoh. You saw the glory of God displayed, but you didn't see the glory of God. You had eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. Where does this blinding and deafening come from? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, friend. There is a blinding today. And there are those who gather in mass who say they are worshiping Jesus, but they have the wrong Jesus, for they see, but they cannot see. They may even see the Bible, but they have no spiritual sight to see the Savior of the world. So don't miss Jesus. Friend, I preach the gospel a lot because one of my greatest fears is that there would be someone in this congregation who has sat in these pews for years under preaching of the gospel and has not been born again. And worse off, they think they're a Christian. So has the Holy Spirit given you eyes that you may see? Have you been rebirthed? What's the answer to all of this? I'm telling you, it's given in context. We have to see this in the context of what it's given. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must be born again if you want to see. You can't even see the kingdom of God. You can't see these spiritual truths unless the Holy Spirit rebirths you. And here in this passage, unless the Holy Spirit rebirths gives you a spring of water in your life, a new heart. We call it the rebirth, the new birth, that in order to see the kingdom of God, in order to see Jesus for who he truly is, the Holy Spirit has to give you a new heart. And that's why we pray for others to be saved. Lord, would you open their eyes? Would you help them see that when they see, they would place their faith and trust in you alone for salvation? So friend, here's the question. Are you the woman at the well? Or were you the woman at the well? Are you the woman at the well? Asking Jesus to make your life better? looking for prosperity in your life that God has never promised? Or were you a woman at the well who Jesus came and said, I have this living water if you would just ask and you say, yes, please. Forgiveness from sin, yes. Eternal life with God, yes. I'm a sinner who needs forgiveness. And my greatest problem is not my physical ailments, but my eternal destiny. So would you save me from my sin? Would you be my king? Would you be my savior? Would you be my Lord? Have you been birthed by the Spirit of God into the family of God? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the clarity of Scripture that we can see our need of sin, that our greatest need can be solved through the power of the Holy Spirit in giving a new birth. If there's one here who's not saved, would you grant that this morning? Would they call out to you to be saved, to be rescued? And would you bring them into the family of God as God's children? Thus they would have a 
spring of life ever springing up in their heart.